thanks for joining me today, Diane. Um, so if you want to get started, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and how you've ended up on this path? Oh gosh, that's a long story. So we'll we'll do the shortened version. So I trained as an ADI back in 2002 with um, Shore Pass. And over the next few years, I got so disappointed with the number of good drivers, but then they'd fail the test due to nerves on the day and doing something that, you know, I come back and go, oh, I don't do that with you on lesson. And then a less able person would pass because the nerves didn't get to them. And I'd seen Paul McKenna doing all this weird and wonderful tapping thing on TV, which I thought was the biggest load of rubbish going. But I decided to explore and do a little bit more research. Um, so come 2008, I had an award from the um, Millennium Awards Trust for Social Entrepreneurs to proceed with my idea, which was to train as a therapist in specialist techniques to get rid of nerves, anxiety, performance on test day, things like nerves at roundabouts or hill starts, also to help pupils with dyslexia and dyspraxia. And I published my book back in 2008, which was called Out of Way to Pass. Um, then for various personal reasons and whatever else, didn't do anything with it for a few years. And now we have a range of videos, courses, ebooks um, to help learners and also to help driving instructors, whether that be ADIs, PDIs, parts two, threes and standards checks. The problem is, is you, you can you can have an idea and you know exactly what you want to say, yeah, yeah. but get it down in a way that a 17 year old will be engaged mm in it because the book primarily we we had the talk at the time of do we write a book for instructors to use with the learners mm. or do we use it for the learners for the lessons and i mean we might talk about this in a bit but what's changed in the industry since 2008 which has been huge changes and so much more on multi-century teaching roles and responsibilities yeah. and how the jobs change but 15 20 years ago it was a case if you do as i tell you this is how you do it and to explore how emotions affect learning that was something the average driving instructor wasn't that into. So we wanted to write a book for learners that would hopefully then filter through to instructors. Yeah. Um, so I guess I've got two questions on that. Go on. Did, did that work? Yeah, for the first one, did it work? Um, yes, it did. Um, it was a bit bizarre because at the time I ended up with the nickname, in fact, this might be down to Chris Penstead, actually, the nickname The Witch, um, because at my local test centre, you'd have a, a fellow ADI come in and they'd have somebody like crying 17-year-old little waif of a girl and they go, die, go and do your magic, go and do your witch stuff on her. And they give you like this pupil two minutes and can you help them? So it had obviously started to filter through. Um, yeah. I think the big difference now to then, 12 years, is how much technology has moved on because then it was just um, a paperback, you order it off Amazon or whatever. Yeah. And you know, no video techniques or anything to go with it. So it's quite sort of primitive, you know. Yeah. Have you considered doing an audiobook version of Elf Way of Us? That's a no. Um, we could do it. It was a yes at the time, and we were debating whether to, to do it. But as technology has moved on, we've now got the online courses. Yeah. So they're video courses. And we, with the, the view of multi-sensory, people either uh, audio, <laughs> visual, or kinesthetic. So they can read the ebook that goes with it or hard copy. They can watch the videos. They can listen. So you've got everything. So it's kind of like, what's the point with an audio book on it now? Okay. My other question was, would you write a follow-up? Well, we have done. Because the original Elle of Wade Pass book, he's kind of been superseded now by all the other books. So it's been uh, changed into some freebies. So things like Preferred Learning Style Guide and Top 10 Reasons for Failure. And that's updated as, so it's uh, going back to the original DVSA figures 12 years ago. The latest figures, I think, were 2019 that came out. That's updated. So on the website, there's a couple of freebies. And then it's been changed into courses such as Driving to nerves online course learn to drive with dyslexia and dyspraxia instructor training manuals uh, fast track to a pass so the original book has kind of expanded over the last 12 years really makes sense okay mm -hmm. all right uh moving on um what p two pieces of advice would you give uh an adi prepping for their part three or their standard check oh good question um i would say 
make sure you've got a balance between confidence and competence. I once taught a boxer and you know these you, these graphs that go up and then back down again and he was talking about aggression versus ability and what he was saying is so you've got aggression here and ability here yeah. and then what happens is is as you get more ability you get the aggression that goes with it in your fighting yeah. right up until the point you're flailing punches everywhere the aggression outruns the ability and you're no longer a decent boxer. And I thought this is really true with confidence and competence because as your ability grows, so does your confidence. Yep. But if you haven't got the ability, then no amount of confidence is going to carry you through your part two, three standard check or whatever. Yep. But then if you've got a great deal of ability, but the lack of confidence, then you're still not going to be successful. So I would say to any trainee PDI or an ADI come for the Sanders check, make sure that your ability is there. Make sure, you know, you do all your competencies and you know what you're doing. And there's loads of instructors out there doing that. That's not my specialist area. But then make sure you have got the confidence in your ability and performance anxiety doesn't get to you on the day. So equal mixture of the two. What actions could you take to increase your confidence? Right, okay. Well, first of all, you, you've got to make sure your ability is there because if you're not capable of doing the job of doing the competences and the standards check or your part threes, then the confidence isn't going to carry you through. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about um, some of the courses that we do, but I've got um, an ebook called How to Beat Part 2, 3, Standard Check Nerves Anxiety. Brilliant. Normally 9 95 but everybody's had a pretty rough time during this last year, so anybody can download it for free. Yep. And that uses some of my techniques that I've been using for 12 years, and also my partner, Chris, he's... Um, psychotherapist as well as ADI and some of his CBT and other styles of techniques so there's lots of stuff there um, we'll talk a bit I hope about how our emotions affect us and how our language creates our emotions so as soon as somebody says things like oh I've got my stance check oh my god I feel nervous I always go to pieces I can't breathe I hate it all of a sudden they're creating all the emotions from their language. So there's lots of stuff in here of how changing your language can also change the emotions and how you feel about it. Yep, that's perfect. What piece of advice do you hear often that you think ADIs should ignore? Uh, I'm going to be shot down in flames for saying this, but, but, but those ADIs who think that nerves don't play a part, emotions don't play a part, um i'm a member of um, a facebook group called how to pass your driving test okay. i also do a fair bit of work for driving test success who produce the four in one app okay. and if you look on those um facebook groups every three or four posts it's going to be i've got my driving test i'm really nervous or, or i'm scared of hill starts or whatever okay. those adis who turn around and go emotions don't affect you no such thing as nerves, no such thing as performance anxiety. If you can do the job, you can do your part two, three, why be nervous? If you are a learner driver and you're prepared for test, why be nervous? You know, you're already prepared, you can do it. Um, I did a little bit of research on this because we were chatting about this the other day. And if you've got a couple of minutes, I just jot a few notes down because those ADIs really annoy me when they say, so long as you're prepared, you shouldn't be nervous. They totally discount the fact of how emotions affect us. So I just did a quick Google search of performers, actors, actors, singers, who get performance anxiety. And this is what I got. So um, Beyonce, Rod Stewart, Rihanna, Harrison Ford, Julia Roberts, Mark Zuckerberg, all of those, experience performance anxiety all really well-known names i'd got a couple of quotes adele apparently in amsterdam she was so nervous she escaped fire a fire exit and refused to go on stage in brussels her words were projectile vomited on someone in the audience <laughs> and before meeting beyonce she had a full-blown panic attack she's still on anxiety meds when she performs she even has a teleprompter 
not just for the words for her songs, but even the banter, even the talk in between songs, she still uses teleprompter. Uh, Andrea Bocelli, who famous opera singer, yeah. um, he says, stage fright is my worst problem. It's the fear of not reaching expectations, which is the same for learners and ADIs, PDIs. Um, Donny Osmond um, suffers social anxiety disorder, uses CBT, which is cognitive behavioural therapy, and he still suffers anxiety, panic attacks during uh, Joseph and Technicolor Dreamcoat. And finally, Ozzy Osbourne. And his quote, I love this, I wrote this down, is Ozzy Osbourne said, to say I suffer from pre-show nerves is like saying when you get hit by an atom bomb, it hurts a bit. <laughs> Excellent. So, yeah, a, a bit of a lengthy answer, but, yeah, those ADIs who think as so long as you're prepared, as so long as you can do the job, or if you learn, as so long as you've had enough lessons, there shouldn't be any need for nerves. Sorry, I don't agree. <laughs> That's brilliant. Right, so for ADIs going back to work, mm. uh, we're, we're now in March 2021. We are expecting to go back to work in April, perhaps mm. May, who knows. Uh, but we're, we're getting closer. Uh, so what would you say is uh, some piece of advice for ADIs right now uh, prepping and what they should do to prep to go back to work? Okay, well, obviously, there's all the physical stuff, but they know all that anyway. Get your diary in order, get your pupil sorted, and make sure your car's clean, got your PPE and whatever. But, I mean, we know that that's, that's been discussed and done to death in every Facebook group going. I would say that for some, there won't be any emotions. Uh, they've been off, they're going back, they can do the job, they've done it 20 years, no worries. I think for others, um, what I've seen people contacting me, especially PDIs or newly qualified who haven't really got into the, the run of going back into it. You know, I could stop for 10 years, go back and teach as if I hadn't left it because you've just done the job for so long. Yep. But for those newly qualified or the ones that haven't got the experience under the belt, it's going to be tough. Um and what I found from people, lots saying they feel anxious about it, um, trepidation, a sense of overwhelm. Um, so lots of techniques in our online courses. We also have something called the ABC technique, which again, you can get in the free standard check ebook. And that will be just as relevant for ADIs feeling that bit of trepidation or anxiety or frustration about going back as it will for, for doing part twos, threes or standard checks. Yep. Um, the ABC focuses on accepting the emotion that you're feeling and acknowledging it. So, yep. you know, yeah, I do feel a little bit stressed. I do feel uncomfortable at this, you know, but that's normal. Everybody's in the same boat and not beating yourself up, not using language like get a grip, pull yourself together, stop being so pathetic because then you create even more adrenaline and cortisol and the stress hormones, and you then get this vicious, vicious circle of anxiety. So, we, we, you know, we, yeah, we can help with that. Brilliant. No, that's perfect. Thank you very much, Diane. Mm -hmm. How do you think learner drivers are going to feel when they come back to, to getting into the car, back to learning, uh, after such a long break? It's been it's about a year, yeah. right? Like, yeah. essentially about 10 months a year. So how do you think learners are going to feel? Right. Everybody's different. And learners are exactly the same as ADIs. Some will just jump back in and they go, OK, I've not had a lesson. I mean, you, you, again, you see on all the Facebook groups of, oh, I've got my test for the 13th of April. I haven't driven for a year, but I'm just going to go and do it. You know, and then the, the instructors go, no, you're not, not in my car. So there's going to be ones that are just just get back into the swing as if nothing's happened. Yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of excitement because they're wanting to get back into lessons. Um, apprehension. Um, I think physically they're going to think they've forgotten everything. Um, we were discussing uh, with somebody the other day about me learning to play the piano and I can read music already, but trying to put both hands together and learn a treble clef and a bass clef even if I'm practicing a few songs at the moment, and even if I have three or four days off, I've got to kind of get myself back into it. So a year off for lots of learners, they're going to, A, think they've forgotten everything, so there's going to be a natural apprehension. So there's going to be the physical challenges, yeah. but also the emotional ones. Uh, there's going to be frustration about how much they have forgotten. 
Yeah. And of course, the more anxious or frustrated they get, the more the cortisol and adrenaline, the more they are going to forget. So you're back on this circle again. Um, I think there's going to be quite a few who are going to have some anxiety over getting back to it, frustration, and um, also anger because of the test waiting times and the money that they spent and they feel yeah. like they're going back a step. So, you know, instructors have got an awful lot of emotions to deal with there, I think. Yeah. How do you spot when a learner is nervous? Oh, right. Good question. Um, I mean, the most obvious thing is they'll tell you. Right. And they will use language. And again, we'll talk about how language creates emotions. But I hate this roundabout. I always stall here. Right. Oh, I don't like doing this. Oh, it's on a hill. Always oh, right up, bleep, bleep, bleep. My back end. Oh, you know, whatever. So they'll tell you. Um, some will, if they're quiet, they might talk more. Some of the normal chatty ones might go, quiet right, okay um physical signs you know i think we've all seen the knuckles on the, the steering wheel or the shoulders tighten up or they sit forward or the classic is the left leg on the the clutch so they're all physical yeah. signs there's also something going a little bit more technical and that's when anxiety increases the limbic system floods the brain with cortisol and adrenaline which are the stress hormones creating the fight flight or freeze i think we all know like you know the caveman response with the, yep. the saber-toothed tiger problem is this then creates because you're so focused on either freezing where you are running away or fighting your way out of the fearful situation two physical things happen one of them is you will experience something called auditory exclusion now um i know you're not an instructor but i reckon if you asked any instructor they've all had a pupil at some stage coming up to a roundabout you go break 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 and it's just gone in one ear and out the other and they got they didn't even hear it or they'll be in the right lane with the right signal on to turn right, then all of a sudden they'll turn left yep. because they've just got this auditory exclusion, they blank everything out. Right. So that's one physical thing that can happen. The other one is um, the shutting down again of, of uh, peripheral vision. So again, if you're focused on running away from that side, saber-toothed tiger, yep. you don't see anything in your periphery. It's just looking ahead. And you, it's like the, you know, the rabbit in the headlights look and you know you'll have a pupil come back from a test you'll listen to a debrief and the examiner will go oh I'm ever so sorry to tell you on this occasion you've not been successful um, I had to break you or you pulled out at the blue car at the roundabout and the pupil will swear blind that there was no blue car there and that's because the vision shut down so you've got this uh, 38 ton truck coming towards you and they just don't see it so that's uh, that's some of the um, the physical signs. That's an absolute mm -hmm. perfect answer. Thank you very much. So we're both on Ancient Paradox. Do you recommend this book for other ADIs? And uh, what's the biggest lesson you took uh, from it? Right. I came across this all uh, many years ago when I was in management, and uh -huh. I didn't resonate with it at the time. And then when I came back, my training as an ADI, I revisited it. And then we were looking for a really, really good analogy for when we were doing the e-books, um, the standard check e-book and the one for learners and the, the online courses. And I read this and I thought, you know what? This is an absolutely fantastic book. So we make reference to it because I use uh, Steve Peters' um, Vision of the Brain. Actually, he trained at Sheffield University, um, the same as my partner, Chris, who's also a psychotherapist. So uh, it's quite, quite interesting listening to them. They've both got the same accent. So he, ha he splits the brain into three main se segments. Um, the front part is your, your frontal lobe, which is the humanistic, the logical processing bit. So if I said, Michael, what are you having for dinner tonight? You would just tell me there wouldn't be any great emotion. You then have your parietal lobe, which he refers to as the computer, which yep. is where all your memories are stored, but he stores the bad memories as well as the good. And then the bit that we're really focusing on is the limbic system, which is the hypothalamus, the thalamus and various other parts. And the amygdala is all part of the limbic system where people call it the emotional seat of the brain. And Steve calls this a chimp. And it's a really good analogy because you can split the difference. Chris's favorite phrase is wisdom, logic, truth, and understanding. Are you processing on those or are you processing on emotion? 
The problem is, is when you come to a, um, a situation that is stressful, the chimp, i.e. your limbic system, is five times faster than your frontal lobe. So in effect, the chimps, right, I'm running, I'm, I'm getting to the parietal lobe, right, let's go through all these files, what can I find? All oh, standards, checks are scary, hill starts are scary, I don't like tests, I feel intimidated, oh my God, I'm being watched. Yep. And the limbic system or the chimp then sets off this cascade of stress hormones and at which point the chimp's taken over yep. the thinking and the chimp brain is in control. Um, so we, I love this as an analogy because learners appreciate it, instructors appreciate it. Um, it's a simple idea to get across to kids as well. I know he's written the silent guides for, for parents and carers and teachers. Um, Jade, one of my pupils, were coming to a roundabout that she would normally go, I hate this roundabout, I'm always scared, I failed my test, and we'd been doing lots of work on her emotions. And about 100 metres away, all of a sudden, she just said out loud, will you shut the fuck up? I'm sorry, what? No, no, not you. Derek told him, sling your hook, shut up, get back on your hammock, go back to sleep. I've got this. I'm in control, not you. And that was that was wonderful because she was recognising that it's her emotions speaking. Yep. It wasn't a calm, rational, logical, knowledgeable mind. It was the emotions trying to take over. Um, there's very quickly there's an instructor called Mick Knowles who's ex army. He does a lot on the groups and he uh, used some of my stuff and told the story of one of his pupils and apparently she wound the window up and chucked the chimp out and said, Get out, sing your hook. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a great book, it's a great analogy. Um, I use it a lot and I think it's really useful and you know, everybody can be an amateur psychologist these days, can't they? But you do really need that little bit more understanding and that I think the book's great. Brilliant. Thanks, Diane. Why is language such a big deal uh, as an EDI um, when you're talking about your standards check and when you're talking about learners getting prepped for, for a test? Right. Um, when Chris and I talk about this, we were trying to do a Zoom meeting about this to instructors and writing all it all it down for the ebook and um, for me to present for the course. And Chris said, you do realize this is like a six months module. <laughs> so he, he, he gets frustrated with me when I give this very brief answer, which is our language, our internal dialogue, our self-talk, what we say to others oh. creates pictures in our minds that creates emotions, that creates behaviors, and then creates our traits. And that's a very, very simplistic view. Yeah. So let if you explore a little bit further, whenever an emotion comes about, it's always as a result of language. Now that could be internal dialogue. It could be what we say to other people, what we write down. But with every thought, there is language behind it we create a picture in our minds. So you're doing it now. So anybody watching this back, at the moment, your eyes are focused on me. As soon as I said you create a picture in your mind, your eyes went up one way, oh. and you're doing it now because you're creating your things. <laughs> you're creating, you're creating language, you're thinking about it, you're creating pictures. Yeah. Now, if that say you've got a learner driver who's coming up for their driving test and they failed a test before at a, a roundabout say, the first thing they're going to do is think, oh gosh, I hope I don't get that roundabout again. Mm. So that's a thought. That's a bit of language in the head. Yeah. Then they get a corresponding picture of what they did last time at the roundabout. They stalled, they rolled back, they pulled out in front of the car, they hesitated, whatever. So their brain's creating this picture. Then all of a sudden, butterflies in the tummy, shaky hands, tightness in the chest. You're doing it again. You're creating. <laughs> yeah, I've got a, a very clear picture. Yeah. yeah, you're picturing it. Yeah. You then start to get the emotion that goes with it. That's then creating the adrenaline, the cortisol, the stress hormones. So you get the intimidation, the frustration, the anxiety, the fear, the panic, the worry, 
uh, whatever emotion goes with it, then creates a behavior. So what's the behavior? <gasps> oh, I failed here last time. <gasps> I better watch my clutch control. Car rolls back, they then snatch. They don't pull out. That's a behavior that then becomes a trait. Every time I get this roundabout, I know I'm going to fail because, and all of a sudden they've taught themselves into failure. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, so language, what we say, yeah. every word that we utter creates our feelings, creates emotions, creates our behaviors, creates our traits. Yeah. So even things like on standards checks, I hate standards checks. I go to pieces. Well, yeah, thing... That's not going to benefit you at all, is it? Like, mm -hmm. that's just kind of almost creates, it, it's basically it creates a vicious cycle. It does. So what then happens is you're using a particular phrase. So the standards check letter, I think the email now, but you know, the brand envelope arrives with your standards check, you open it up. And your emotions are so fast. As soon as you read that, you're invited. <laughs> lovely. You're invited to your standards check. That adrenaline is there. I've even had instructors say, you know, they know they've got the standard check or the part three coming up in however many weeks. And every time they drive by the test center, they're thinking, oh, in four weeks, that's going to be me. In three weeks, that's going to be me. And the anxiety, and the anxiety, and the anxiety builds. And it's all created from their language, what they're saying. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's, that's a really good point. Two questions left. Um, what's changed since you last qualified? Oh, gosh. Um, two main things, I would say. Standard check and part threes have changed. Um, I can still quote, today we're going to learn how to perform a turn in the road. By the end of the which, we'll be able to perform with little or no help from me. And it was all very structured and uh, you had a pupil at this level and a pupil at that. That's And you role played with the examiner. You were identifying faults, analysing sorting out what the problems were and it's all very structured now i think it was what, 2014 when the standards check and then the part threes then changed yeah. it's a lot more client-centered now roles and responsibilities getting the pupil to take more responsibility for their own learning a lot more client-centered a lot more coaching involved um there's loads of discussions about this on the various Facebook groups and there's always split camps on it, you know, difference between client-centered could be telling them what to do, doesn't necessarily have to be coaching. So, so much has changed there. And I think there's now a lot more need for mine and Chris's techniques because people are realizing that behaviors and emotions play such a large role in it. So I would say the teaching role has now finally caught up um, yeah. to where it kind of should be. Yeah. What goes hand in hand with that, and I, I messaged you um, a slide earlier if you got it from one of my talks, yeah. is the anxiety amongst teenagers. Um, there was a study going back 15 years, anxiety amongst teenagers aged 17 to 19 was just under 8%. Yep. Now, the latest study, the figures came out, I think, November 18, is when Anton Deck did the Britain Get Talking campaign on BGT, and prevalence of anxiety, teenage girls aged 17 to 19, is 22.4% have some form of anxiety or behavioural or emotional disorder, of which I think, I can't remember, it was either a quarter or I think a half of those have attempted suicide or self-harm. Uh, and so pe people, you know, they, they use all, the, there's lots of discussion about this and Chris and I are writing a new course for schools at the moment called Phoenix, which is a, a whole other area yeah. we've been working on during lockdown. And it's, you know, is there a, a lot more narcissism? Is it, you know, this awful word snowflakes mm. banded about? Is it a lack of empathy and feelings? Is it social media? I mean, we've been really delving down the rabbit hole on this of what is happening to teenagers. But I think every instructor who's done this job like me 10, 20 years will have seen an increase in nervous anxiety affecting them. Last question, Diane. Um, can you tell me about um, your driving test nerves pro course? Okay, right. So um, going back to the intelligent instructor, 
ADI and JC conference back yep. in October 2019, we launched the driving test. I was one of the speakers there and we launched the driving test nerves online course. So, you know, we talked about my original elevator pass book. Yep. It was rewritten in um, 2019 to... Uh, how to beat driving test nerves anxiety, taking lots of the techniques out of it, including a lot of Chris's stuff as well. Um, so we produce the ebook and then we pr produce the videos. So it's me sharing some of the techniques and how to do them, what's happening in the mind, um, confidence, competence, balance, talking a little bit about the chimp and what happens with the limbic system and emotions, um, stories learners, as uh, stories of learners and learners featuring in it. So that was launched as the Driving Test Nerves online course, and we kept being asked from it for instructors, or rather than the learners buying it, can we have something similar? So in the vein of like Theory Test Pro, um, we've set it up, it's normally 9.95 a month, and that's uh, an instructor can then add up to 30 students on a rolling basis. So it's unlimited students, 30 at any one time. So two or three instructors could share it if a school between 30 students. And that gives the instructor and up to 30 students access to all of the videos in the Driving Test Nerves online course. There's also the instructor course you get access to, which does a bit more of the deep dive into the mind, talks a little bit more like we've discussed about yeah. how language creates emotions and what to do about it. And also the ebook, How to Beat Driving Test Nerves Anxiety. So basically an instructor signs up and then they can add up to 30 students at any one time. It's normally 9.95 a month, which is what, a cup of coffee a week. Um, but uh, for since last March, we've been giving it free for three months. Because as we discussed earlier, there's going to be a lot of students going to be anxious about coming back to lessons. So by signing up now, you've still got three months of it free. Then at the end of three months, no contract. So if you think, do you know what? It's not worth it. None of my you learners have used it. I don't have anybody who's nervous about the test. All my learners are fine. I'm great on my standards check. I'll just cancel it. Yeah. or they'll think, well, you know what, for a cup of coffee a week to give all the learners access to this to help me with my part two, three standard check, it is worth it and can keep it going. So I'll give you the link to, to that. There's also um, a contact page with support. So if you're unsure of how to download or how to use the videos, how to sign up, there's support there as well. Um, on top of that, the ebook, how to beat part two, three standard check, nervous anxiety again it's normally 9.95 but it's been such a tough year for everybody we just think it's nice to be able to give a bit back and give that for free so everybody can get that for free and again we'll give you the the links for it right thank you very much diane and um and i look forward to chatting with you again really soon um so take care yeah nice to meet you and thanks for your time michael bye-bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.